you about my Jesus. His love is strong and His grace is free. The good news is that I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen, sing it, hallelujah, 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 and let my Jesus change your life. Lord God, for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would certainly have your way in this place amongst your people, Lord God. Receive the praise and honor that you alone deserve tonight. I count on one thing the same God who never fails will not fail me now. He won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late. He's working all things out. Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will all my days. Oh, yes.
situation we find ourselves in. Life is sometimes challenging, Lord, as you well know. I just ask, Lord, for your sake, Lord God, and for ours as well, that we be found giving you glory and honor in every situation. Receive your praise tonight. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus and I just want speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. And I just want to speak. The name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your Break every straw. 
shadows burn like a fire. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear, every heart, and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will burn like a fire in every life, Lord God, in every heart. I pray, Lord God, where the flame is 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 flickering, Lord God, I pray that you would fan it and cause it to grow, Lord God. Help our hearts to, to be on fire for who you are, to, to proclaim your truth, to proclaim hope and healing and deliverance, Lord God, from every, every dark depression, everything that we can be afflicted by, Lord God, you are the answer for it all. We come to you tonight, Lord God, asking that you would have your way in every heart and every life, and we give you glory in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Well, hopefully, I put the microphone. I know, don't, don't, don't get used to that. That's a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, although I will say this real quick, and I, I don't want to eat too much time off, but I actually in Bible school had to wear dress shoes, dress pants, a dress shirt, and a tie. So my question was just simply, why not the whole suit? So I wore a suit to school every day. So. Yeah, I almost didn't go to school just because of the dress code. And I, I was like, yeah, I I should follow the Lord. I guess I can sacrifice for Jesus here. Now, um, before I, I jump into uh, opening up for prayer requests, we will do that. And because there's literally nobody running sound, I'm going to try not to step into feedback zones. So I'm like Pastor Jeff, who can manage to walk down and back and forth. Uh, I'm not even going to try risking that. So... I do apologize if it feels like cold and stiff, but the coat will come off in just a little bit. And I want to just kind of give you an update. Pastor Jeff was supposed to be here, but he's not feeling well. It's nothing critical. He's not, like, dying or anything. Like, it's not extreme. He didn't come back when it's, like, nearly on the edge of hospitalization. He's just not feeling good, and we're going to be leaving on Sunday after church for a pastoral staff retreat. So he, needed, he wanted to make sure he could rest. Plus, he has no sub for, in me for Sunday because I will not be here Sunday. I'm actually guest preaching at another church for a friend. So we're kind of making sure that we don't run out of people to get on, you know, get up here and preach a good message here. And we do have Pastor Danny, but he can only wear so many hats in one day. So, so if you know, obviously, please pray for him. But just so you know, it's nothing alarming. He's just recovering. And I guess it sounds like he's singing in a death metal band right now with his voice. So, um so I, I kind of was just wondering if, like, if he could just read, like, maybe, like, Revelation. That might be really cool sounding, but no dice. So with that, um, there is a couple other things. Christine is actually, she did test positive for COVID. It's on the public prayer chain, so I'm not giving confidential information out. So if you think about lifting her up, nothing that sounded like it's, she's doing horrible, but not feeling good. And so there goes another person, and then Richard. If you guys haven't heard her husband, he's in the hospital with an infection in his foot. 
And now it sounds like they thought he was going to leave today, but now it sounds like it might be staph infection. So you could definitely use some prayer. With that, now that I just dumped them all on you, I believe, I haven't been in a Wednesday night service in a long time. For those who don't know, I'm the youth pastor here. I'm Pastor Brian. I should have introduced myself. Some faces I've only seen a couple times. So I'm normally down on the other end, not skipping church, but hanging out with the youth. And normally about this time, we'd probably be throwing a dodgeball at each other or something fun. But I'm not going to do that to you, but we are going to take prayer requests. So is, I believe, is it still just open forum I heard right? Correct? Okay. We're just going to break this right out. Free. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, they're sick too. Okay, yeah, for sure. Anybody else? Kim. Oh, that's why he's not here. Uh-huh, nice excuse. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. you got to pick on the kids and the young people. Christine. And you said it was on his liver? Okay. Anybody else? I've seen. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Anybody else? If I miss something, please just let me know. I'm, oh, can we have another one? Just the work pressure of that. Yeah, if I miss something, just when I get done, just let me know. I will go back and we'll pray for it. I don't want to miss anything intentionally. I don't have the monom like all the memory techniques Pastor Jeff must use. <sighs> Lord, I do lift up Christine's husband Bob to you and ask that. First and foremost, that whatever's going on with his this lesion on his liver or wherever it is, Lord, that in your grace, your incredible, abundant grace and mercy, that not only will it be non-cancerous, but Lord, that you would even go in and heal it without needing surgeries, procedures, medicine, but that you would display for him clearly your power, your patience with him, your love, and Lord, that I realize so often people in the scriptures asked you for signs and didn't matter what happened. You even came back from the dead and it wasn't enough for many people. But for some reason, people like Paul, who were so bent and determined to oppose you and the movement that was in your name, his heart was softened, and softened with an encounter with you. And so I ask Holy Spirit that even now, even though he scoffed a bit and mocked the idea of having somebody praying for him, as that something, a seed, something would just begin to break the hardness of his heart. Lord, that he would 
just even a prick of light getting through, just a pinhole of light starting to get through, and just the revelation of who he is, where he is, and just the grand scheme of everything, and just how incredible you are, and just the truth, Lord, whatever emotional lies he's bought into that's made him think that you're not real, you're not worth following, whatever it is, Lord, that you would heal those, Lord, that you would reveal where he has genuine questions, revelation of truth, that he would come to accept you. Lord, I lift up Lori and ask, Lord, I for her back, if I remember her knee had been bothering her, and it just probably feels like there's one pain and issue after another. And Lord, I ask that you would touch her and heal her, that you would restore anything that's out of place, any inflammation that you would bring down, and just a gracious touch of healing in her life. Lord, I lift up Noah, Chris, Zach, Richard, I mean, Christine, Pastor Jeff, all these people who are sick, Lord, whether whether it's COVID, whether it's the flu, whether it's just some other virus, bacteria, whatever it is, Lord, just ask that in the season where it seems like allergies and seasonal changes and colds and everything can just wears people down, Lord, that you would, just because of your loving kindness, heal them and just restore them to full, full health and energy. Lord, I ask for wisdom for Kim on what needs to happen in that work situation. I know that, it, obviously, there's things that need to happen in that office with culture, with why there's less people, and all those things that are outside of what she was praying for, but specifically ask for wisdom for her. Lord, that you would let her know if she should take the position or not, if she should stay and look for another place, not because of frustrations, not because of exhaustion, but because she's willing to do your will. And so, Lord, I ask that not only will she hear you clearly, but, Lord, that it wouldn't be whether it's feeling guilt and shame if she'd look somewhere else, but at the same time that she wouldn't just abandon shit because it's tough. Because where we are weak, you are strong. Your perfect grace is made known. So I ask that you would strengthen her in this time, but give her clarity, wisdom, and a clear leading. Lord, I lift up Kira to you and ask that the stuff going on with her kidneys. Lord, I, I realize that this has been something I'm going for her, and I ask that, Lord, that, that she would celebrate and her, and her family would celebrate the progress, but also at the same time, if there's something that needs to be done different, that they would have wisdom. If there's a change in direction that they would know clearly, that the people involved would know. Or if it's just stay the course and things are going to continue to get better, that they stay the course. But ultimately, you're asking for, we, we trust your will to be done, but Lord, you say to bring our cares and concerns to you. So we put it before you right now and ask that you would heal her and bring an end to this. Lord, and I realize I'm missing somebody else, so I don't want to break. Josh, thank you. I'm like, all right. There's... Lord, I ask for just continual protection for Josh. I realize that you obviously have been I'm sure you could share plenty of stories where he's seen your hand of protection in his life. But, Lord, continue to protect him. Lord, that he would be quick to respond in the instant when your spirit's warning him of something coming up. And he would be quick to respond in sensitivity to you. And, Lord, that you would not only guard him, but, Lord, that you would give him favor on the road, smooth travels and everything he needs. In, in the time of travel, that he would find it's a time where he can spend with you, communing in intimacy with you, and that he would continue to just find himself receiving revelation, peace, comfort, joy, and all the things that come when we spend time in your presence. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, did I miss anybody else? Oh, <laughs> Well, it's different than memorizing names, eh? All right. Well, <clears throat> I do ask for, I am going to teach tonight. For those who hear me on Sunday, you can probably used to a style that I normally bring. Tonight's not that night. I'm going to actually follow through with the normal style you came for on a Wednesday expecting, which is more teaching. But we're not going to go verse by verse through a scripture, as fun as that would be. Instead, we're actually going to do a teaching on an issue that I think I think a lot of people struggle with. And the broad category will be evangelism. 
But very specifically, we're going to get to what I think is an underlying problem that we run into with evangelism, and that's talking to people who are apathetic. So we're going to do two. I'm going to ask you for extreme grace, because I did say I had to write and prep a, a speech, and because I do need to deliver it in front of an audience, I'm going to have a captive audience. I'm going to give you a very formal speech. It's going to be very dry, probably, in some ways, because I have to make it academic. Then I'm going to actually give you a bonus, because I have an incredibly long outline that I will not actually be able to fully develop. I think the Microsoft Word said it was like over 2,200 words, and I have 7 to 10 minutes to put a speech in. So I'm going to do a bonus for you guys that nobody else was going to get, and I'm going to actually develop the thought a lot more because there's a lot more that I can't say in the official speech that I want to tell you, and I think it's actually super helpful, but more specifically, it will hopefully challenge not you to do as a technique, but to think through what is going on when you're talking to somebody. Oftentimes, we think of techniques. The four laws, like, oh, well, have you ever sinned? And this, there's all sorts of great ones, and there's gr the techniques are great. But the problem is, if you don't understand the fundamental things going on, you're going to be frustrated when you're witnessing and telling somebody about Jesus, because you'll find yourself hitting up against a brick wall, talking past each other which is not beneficial at all. So I'm going to try to actually share some revelation that led to this speech because I was going to originally talk about a very, well, I think it's a very fun, simple to write, maybe not simple to elaborate on, topic of reliability of the scriptures. And I'll share the story of how I went from talking about how we know the Bible is reliable to this. So for about seven to ten minutes, you will actually see me do the impossible and try to use notes. After that, the notes are gone, and I'm talking. And I hope, when this is all said and done, that you actually find not only a helpful, but maybe even challenge some of your own thinking. <clears throat> so, thank you for listening to the short version. Like I said, we'll give you the long version in just about ten minutes. So there's a growing number of people in the United States in particular, but really most of Western society, who's walking away from religion in general, but Christianity specifically. In fact, if you look at the Barna Group, they've been tracking the growing number of what they call nuns, N-O-N-E-S, nuns, who are either atheist, agnostic, or just have no religious affiliation. In fact, when you look at something that Jones wrote in 2016, she noted not only the growing trend, but between her work, which referenced Barna and Pew Research and others, she noticed that not only is this a growing trend, but also there's a lot of indifference. In fact, Barna notes that inside of their research, that even though now people are moving into the nun category, they're also becoming very cold and numb to religious things. There's a temptation to think to solve this problem, though, we just need better arguments and proofs. But the problem is, it's not always true. In fact, we can see in the opening chapter of 1 Corinthians that Paul is stressed, especially in 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25, that he didn't come with persuasive speech because ultimately... To Jews, the cross is a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, it's foolishness. Really what's going on is there's a growing number of people who are apathetic to Jesus. They just don't care. As a result, they don't really care if Jesus is real or not. It's not even important to them. I experienced this recently. I was at location, I was actually at work, at the bus garage, and I was sitting there thinking about the speech topic I wanted to do, which is the reliability of the Bible. And in that conversation, or in that moment I meant, I was able to ask one of the people in work, who I'm pretty sure doesn't have any relationship with God, what would it take for you to believe in the Bible, and it being true and accurate? She thought for a moment, and then responded very simply, I don't know. 
that bothered me. And as I was thinking about it, that's when I realized it does not matter what evidence I show and prove, she doesn't care. And although there's an immense value, and for those who have been in our youth group know, I've taught a lot of things on apologetics, the defending our faith, understanding what's true and not true. It does little to persuade somebody who does not care. You know, this is incredibly hard to speak from notes. So I'm just going to talk to you guys. My speech will wait for another day. I'm like, let me just give this to you. I'm like, see, this is why notes are horrible for me. Here's the reality. It's such a dumb time. Like, well, I wish they could just use my sermons. No, 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 it's okay, because I'm annoyed by te- I didn't even want to do this, so I'm going to, like, my family's going to get to be my audience for the speech. Let me just explain what's going on. This is, I, I hate academic-style speaking, because it's, like, I'll make it engaging, but quote Jones, 2016. Who cares? Who cares the research? Here's the reality. This lady, I was talking to her. I was talking to her about that. I was literally, I was sitting there praying. And I felt like God, I was praying about what I was going to talk about. And I felt like God said, hey, ask her what it would take. And I kind of shook it off. Because I don't know if you guys know how awkward it is at work to randomly ask somebody about something to do with God, religion, whatever you want to call it. Mitchell. Oh, oh, you were there for that too, yeah. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) And, oh yeah, I remember that a couple times, but yeah. So, I'm like, all right, but I I just, after about three times, Fred. Not just the words, the tone, the body language, the fact that if I asked you a question, let's say about politics and what you thought about what happened, and I'm not asking to have a dialogue here, but if I asked you about what happened in the 2020 political election, if you paid attention at all, you have a response. You know what you thought, you know how you felt, you know what you think should happen. You might not be right, you might not have evidence, but you at least would have some type of emotional response. You would also have some kind of cognitive reason or opinion. But the fact that with just a moment of pondering, you could see the stop what she was doing. She was in the middle of playing a game on her Nintendo Switch. I'm not criticizing that. Just trying to give you context because you weren't there. You can't visualize. So she took the time to stop what she was doing to actually fully engage what I asked to come to the conclusion she had no idea, which leads to a reasonable theory that she's never really thought about it. That's possible too. And that's very possible. Now, a little more context is I've actually worked with her on a few, on a, yeah, a couple of times on bus routes. So, I mean, it's not like it was completely cold, but you're right, there could be shields. But I think in general, and again, based on age demographics, based on what's happening in the United States as a whole, based on a lot of factors, I would be willing to state pretty comfortably, in her case, she doesn't care. But even if it's not her, there's a lot of people if you go out and talk to them. And that's the hard part. And that's kind of where this came from, is the realization for me, and what I wanted, why I wanted to teach on this a little bit, is the realization that so many people today, they're not really arguing from a place of, I don't believe it. They're not arguing from a place of, I have credible evidence. They're not even arguing from a place of personal opinion. They're arguing from a, they're not even arguing. They just don't care. They'd rather just say, that's for you. You can believe what you want. I'm okay. That's great. You know, I've tried that. You know, something very brushed off. She didn't try to engage. Like, I never thought about that question. That's really interesting. What, like, I don't even know, like, what would be something? Like, there was no, like, con- like further dialogue she was offering. It was, I don't know. And she's like, I'm sorry, I can't help and moved on. And again, the point isn't about, wow, what's wrong with her? The point was making me think, what's wrong with the message that we have? What's wrong with what we've been doing as a church, not Sunrise, Church Universal, that we have people who come to a place that they hear the name of Jesus, they hear the concept of the Bible, they hear this, I, this 
structure that we would call Christianity, this organization we call Christianity, and it doesn't even phase them. It's, I mean, it literally, it would be like me going up and talking about, somebody coming and talking about fishing. I just don't care. Some people love fishing. Sorry, Mitchell. I love fishing. I, mean, I know people love fishing. I have family members. I've gone. I'm not anti-fishing. I just don't care. In fact, a little bit of the backstop for me was when I was about 18-ish, I was asked if I wanted to go to a church. And I wasn't anti-church. I just thought church had no point. I thought it was a waste of time. I'm like, why would anybody go to church? It just doesn't seem necessary. So I went, but it didn't really mean much to me because it's just church. Yeah. I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. I don't think that's the only thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's, again, there's some validity to that. And there's some people, but again, I think a growing trend's even moving away from that. Because, again, that was the justification. It, but I, can I ask, are they over 35, 40 years old, those people? Okay. Yeah, so I think, I think when you look in specifically... Specifically, when you look at the, the statistics, again, from Barna, you look and notice that it's, you start to get down to, like, millennials, Gen Z, which is weird for me to even think that most generational things put me as a millennial. I feel like I don't have, like, anything in common with millennials, but technically, that's where some will classify me. And you look at those ages, again, it's not even a defense at this point. Where that, where this, these individuals you're saying are giving a, an obstacle, like, hypocrisy or whatever, which... Which I wish I had a lot of time to develop the hypocrisy argument because that's a, hypocrisy isn't I give a standard and I can't meet the standard. Hypocrisy is I'm pretending to be one thing and I'm not. Hypocrisy would be therefore like if I as a pastor got up here and said because I'm perfect and you're not. Well, I was going to take this one flaw you to find, which you'll find very quickly and easily to be like, well, you're hypocritical. But if I got up here and said Jesus is the perfect standard that we're pursuing. And none of us are going to reach that mark. And you say, well, look at the flaws you have. I'm like, well, that's all you found? Like, there's plenty more. That's not hypocrisy. That's just being honest, saying this is what we're called to. In fact, the hardest part is, and again, I can't spend a lot of time on here because then I'll lose the framework, but one of the hard parts is we're getting sucked into an argument that's not even the argument of Christianity. See, Christianity is not an argument about being perfect or being good. It's actually, it's actually antithetical to the whole point of Christianity, which is you aren't good. You will never be good enough on your own. Therefore, you have to have Jesus. So when you get into a hypocritical argument, you're getting stuck to a no-win argument because that's not even the gospel anymore. So don't get sucked into those things. I'm not saying you did. I'm saying I'm just as a general hold to everybody. Don't get sucked into those things because if you get sucked into them, you're not going to get anywhere. It's a waste of time. I don't, I don't remember exactly how the old expression goes but basically don't wrestle with a pig in the mud because the, you're both going to get muddy and the pig loves it you're not going to it doesn't matter the outcome it's not going to be good for you so, so yeah I 100% agree. I mean, 
because unfortunately I had to trim things because of topical, you know, isolation on this. I didn't get into that in here, which you guys aren't hearing, but that's actually one of the major prongs that I think we need is the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I, if I cut that part of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians out, if you actually look at chapter 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians, which you will be, teaser alert, I believe Pastor Jessica will link to 1 and 2 Corinthians next. So when you're looking at that, you'll notice one of the things Paul says in there is, I didn't come with persuasive arguments, which is interesting because if you read Paul's letters, he spends a lot of time with persuasive arguments. But he's saying, beyond persuasive arguments, I came by a demonstration of the power spirit. And so I 100% agree with that statement and that sentiment. And I do think, as much as I would love to say one of the greatest witnessing tools is the power of God, because it is. When you're talking to somebody who does not believe in God, and they experience a miracle personally. I'm not saying you testify to a miracle. They experience a miracle. It changes things. 100%. But at the same time, and I'm not trying to speak doubt for those who believe in power of words in that regard, but there are people who will, they will experience God, but they will justify it with some kind of secular explanation. Oh, it was because, oh, the, the scan didn't really... It was just a mistake in the scan. That's why the tumor's not there. It's like, no, it wasn't a bad scan, you guys. It's called healing. It's a divine miracle. So, and that gets into a whole other thing. So what I want to, because we're going to get into a couple rabbit trails, which I'm going to be okay with. I'm a, Let me just kind of give you the framework so we can rabbit trail all day long. And I'll give you the framework so you can use it. And this is it. This is what I really want to kind of give you as an understanding. When you're talking to somebody, most people... When they hear something, they'll at least consider what they hear. Let me explain that a lot more than what I just did. Using a current event as an example, Putin you know, you know, blew up all over the news. Putin starting to use nuclear weapons. So many people considered what he said. Yet, I'm assuming safely, everybody in here listening to me right now, and probably everybody online who listens to me sometime in the future, has no bearing, besides for prayer, not taking away the power of prayer, but in a personal, relevant way, has no bearing on the situation. None of you probably have Putin on your phone. Probably none of you can even speak Russian, I'm going to assume. Maybe some of you can shock me. But So we're not calling up Putin and be like, hey, I disagree with your threat. I don't think this is a very good move. But yet, people are talking about it. They're thinking about it. People are blowing up on social media. I don't really pay a lot of attention, but I'm pretty safely guessing based on little I do see that people are talking about Elon Musk and what he's doing and his poll and buying Twitter. Why? Has practically no bearing on anything that we do. Yet when Jesus says, I'm God, and without me you're going to hell for eternity, it's like, yeah, who cares? It's your belief. It's your opinion. But I don't necessarily think when somebody actually considers how serious that statement is, that they won't at least consider it. And I think the problem with apathy is we've allowed, which is kind of what some of the different comments, Fred and, and other people have mentioned already in here, not only the lack of power, but, yeah, why not just step into landmines? This one's, I don't think hundreds of millions of people are going to listen to this online. So, um... I feel like pretty safely can say with certainty too many churches have gotten concerned with drawing crowds and not preaching truth. Amen. Okay, wow, thank you for actually amending that. But it's, it's all amen until truth starts flying into the cut and we don't like what we hear. But I do believe that not only do we need the power of God, we need the truth. And I think part of what's happened and why people aren't concerned is there's an actual teaching framework out there for pastors and teachers and churches that basically goes along the lines of, if you're going to teach, make sure somebody who doesn't even believe in Jesus can walk away and apply it to their life. I 100% disagree with that philosophy. And the reason I disagree with that philosophy is, the whole point of coming to church being a Christian is, you should only be living out a relationship with Jesus. Everything should pull back into that faith. If I teach you how to be a good person without God, that's not, again, back to the message. That's not the gospel. If I teach you how to be generous without pulling it back to Jesus, 
That's not the gospel. If I teach or anybody else is teaching you something and you don't need God for it, that's just self-help. And while self-help has value, I'm not trying to deny the value of self-help, it reduces the need to ever commit to Jesus. Well, it's very easy to be apathetic when you think the only thing that matters is being a good person because the church is focused on being a good person. That is not the target. If you make it the target, let me just help you, this is off, way off topic for a second, but if you make that the target, you're wasting your time because you're trying to earn something that God's already given you. We're told that righteousness, meaning right standing with God, meaning flowing God's character through us, comes through the new creation you're made when you accept Jesus. You're not trying to earn it. You're not trying to prove it. You live it out because you're communing with God. You will naturally change and become a good person because of your relationship with him. You don't have to work at it. What you're working at is being close to him. You're working at emulating him. That will lead to the things that you're saying, I need to focus on. Those are the byproducts. It's like people, uh, I'll just step on out of my word. Using an analogy that will hopefully not offend anybody, but it's like people who go to the gym thinking it's just about going to the gym to lose weight. That's not why you go to the gym. You go to the gym because by working out and doing the things of being active and doing these exercises with this diet, you become healthier, which leads to the outcome of weight loss. But we focus on that weight loss, and when three weeks later you're like, I've only lost two pounds, you become discouraged. Well, at least I do. So let me just say me. <laughs> I become discouraged. And I'm like, my goodness, this should be down 30 pounds already. And I should be ripped coming out like a bodybuilder after at that time. I mean, like, what is going on? I'm curling at least 20 pounds. <laughs> In all seriousness, it's discouraging. If you look at your life compared to what we're supposed to aim for, it's discouraging. And the flip side isn't saying grace, 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 because what happens when we do grace, 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 is we abdicate responsibility to change. That's not what God's calling us to either. The change is I'm pursuing God, and that change happens. So that was a sidebar. That was free admission. So what happens is people are apathetic because they think, what we're talking about is being a good person. What they think we're talking about is following religious duties. What we're talking about is without Jesus, there is no hope. We are lost and doomed. Not only collectively we would be, which just newsflash, end of story, you can read it. I'm, not, I'm spoiler alert though, if you've never read the end of the Bible, you can't save this planet. It will not be saved. So, Anything like that, while we should be good stewards, that's not what the target is. The target's not to, the goal, the purpose of the church isn't to make the government better. And while there's a lot of good things, it's not, I mean, in fact, we, you know, right to life does great things. But the goal of the church isn't to stop abortion. Those are byproducts. That's a byproduct of saying because we value life, we're standing on these things. But the goal's not political action. Because here's the amazing thing. If the church was effective, the laws wouldn't matter. The reason the law and that wouldn't matter is it would change because it would reflect the heart of the people. Because people would no longer feel like they need it. People would no longer feel like that's my only hope. People wouldn't feel like, well, because it's legal, I'll go. They're like, I know there's a church family that is going to take care of me. All these things. But we focus on these things, and people think that's what the church is about. In fact, part of the reason young people, going back to that millennial Gen Z, Part of the things they complain about is they feel like the church is just against things. It's against homosexuality. It's against, well, they wouldn't say abortion. They would say woman's choice. But they would say we're against these things. We're against having freedoms. They're against, and that's not what we're about, but that's how we're labeled. So then you, we wonder why somebody doesn't care. So if we can get to the point where at least they hear the core message which is, without Jesus, you will never be good enough, and the only option is eternal punishment. And there's a lot of techniques. Again, I'm not going to techniques here. I want to go to framework of philosophy. And if once somebody hears that and can realize, well, that's a pretty serious claim. 
If somebody came to me and said, Muhammad said, unless you confess to Allah and Muhammad's his prophet, you're going to spend eternity in hell, I'm going to consider that claim. And just to answer that, a fair objection is, would I do the same thing with other religions that I'm advocating with Christianity, which is evaluate what is said? A hundred percent. Because we're pursuing truth, not our bias. The comforting news is, if you pursue truth, you will always come to the conclusion that what God has said, God of the Bible, is true. We don't have anything to worry about. It's true. But if we come off and say, I don't care what Muhammad says, and we won't give the people the same respect. I don't care what Buddha says. We won't give them the same respect. I don't care what your atheistic view is. We don't give them the same respect. Of course they're not going to respect what we're saying. They're like, you're closed-minded? I'm not even open to this. But if you could say, hey, I consider these things, and that's another day, another time. This is why I believe super strongly what I said earlier in my attempt to read a note, which is knowing the defense and reasons for our belief are so immensely important. Because if you understand and somebody wants to actually have an intellectual discussion, you're not just saying, well, I just don't believe that. You're not being closed-minded. You're able to be open-minded and say, hey, I've actually considered that. You know, this, that, and the other thing. I've noticed this is what I found in my research. Have you thought about that? And you're actually able to dialogue. You're going to find out real quickly if that person's just trying to get you off course or if they actually are being serious. So the first thing, to reiterate this again, not in normal styles to try to teach, but the first thing is to get somebody to realize that this is actually something that has been said. And if you can get people to at least consider what was said, the first thing they need to do is just check. Is it true? Did Jesus really say that? Right? I mean, I could come up to you and say, Jesus said cleanliness is next to godliness. And you're like, oh, okay. And then you go look it up. It's not true. It doesn't say that anywhere. Heard somebody recently, a guy who I respect greatly, who's not a theologian or pastor or anything, he made a comment. He's like, you know, Jesus said. And I'm like, yeah, he didn't say that. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great concept, but not what Jesus said. You know, so the first thing you got to do is, did Jesus really say that? So what's important to be able to do if you're dialoguing and somebody will actually talk about it, is to actually know, did Jesus actually say he's God? Did Jesus actually say he's the only way to heaven? I have a close friend who, he, he had a really interesting statement. He said, all roads lead to heaven, just one gets to stay. Yeah, I know, it's a fantastic line by Pastor Kyle. He's... Because everybody's going to go to heaven one day, to, or go at least to the throne room to be judged. Only one gets to stay. So, yeah, Pastor Kyle Orr, I'll give full credit to that. So let me give you the scripture references, just so I don't go from memory. But did Jesus ever claim to be God? If you're taking notes in any way, shape, or form, a few you can use in a, di in a discussion is John. Most people, if you go to pull it out and read it, they don't really care. Let me just help you. If they're apathetic, they don't care you read a Bible verse. So, more importantly, is just being able to explain what it says or quote it and not tell them you're quoting, thus saith the Lord in John chapter 8, you're very probably going to turn them off. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying, honestly, from a technique standpoint, if somebody came up to me and started quoting the Quran, I don't care. Somebody came up and quoted me some text from Buddha, I don't care. So, somebody who could care less about God doesn't care you quote from the Bible. You just need to be able to explain, and if they ask where, to know where. That's when you give it to them. Well, I want to go look it up. Okay, well, this is where you can find it. Do you know how to look that up? They'll say, I know how to use Google. I'm just saying. Just Let's think it through honestly. What you want to do is not try to show and flex what you know, and you're not trying to win an argument. You're trying to lovingly tell somebody who you know needs the truth, or at least you assume everybody needs the truth, but you're assuming, and that's the point. If you're this far, and they don't know Jesus claimed to be God, they're probably not saved. Just fair enough. They could be, but probably not. Because it's pretty important to be saved and know that Jesus is the Son of God who lived a sinless life, was, who was attested by miracles, who you know, sin, never sinned, perfect lamb, went to the cross, died for you and I, was buried for three days, was resurrected, was for 40 days, made appearance upon appearance, and was ascended into heaven and one day coming back. That's kind of the basic framework of doctrines that you got to understand to then be able to say, I'm giving my life. You know, where it says in Romans, confess with your mouth and with, that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart, which is a surrendering to God, saying, I know you're God, 
I'm giving up on my life. I'm dying to you, giving it to you, leaving you, following you. You know, really fast. But those are some of the basics that somebody pretty much has to understand and believe to be saved. In fact, if you're listening online and here and that, you're like, I've never known that. I don't even know if I believe that. We need to talk. I would love to talk with you and make sure you're good. But so if you're taking notes, you're know, like, where would you find it? There's a couple that I really love. One is in John, specifically we're looking at John chapter 8, verses 58 to 59. This is taken inside of an exchange. In this exchange, Jesus is going back and forth with religious leaders and then Jews as a whole. And they're going back and forth. And for anybody who thinks Jesus was just a pushover and soft and just got, you know, taken advantage of, this is a great example that Jesus stood his ground for what was true and right. They're going back and forth, and he's like, you're the son, you're children of the devil. They're like, who are you to say this? And eventually, they're talking about Abraham, like, we're children of Abraham. He's like, if you were children of Abraham, then you would believe me because he's looking forward to the day I am. And like, how could he be looking forward to you if you're not even yet 50 years old? And he basically says, before Abraham was, I am. Which is very critical because at the burning bush when Moses says, and who do I say set me? God says, I am who I am. He's referencing clearly. How do I know it's clear? Because the next response from the Jews isn't, well, that's a really weird response. They grab stones to kill him because he's claiming to be God. The argument that Jesus never claimed to be God is a pretty ignorant one overall because it's weird that people who heard him speaking and knew what was going on in the culture at the time Knew he was claiming to be God, which is why they wanted to kill him. But if that's not explicit enough, there's another time. Jesus, after being arrested, incredible story. If you've never read the Gospels where it talks about Jesus being betrayed and arrested. Incredible what's going on. I mean, in fact, some of the Gospels, like Mark, it's a large percentage of the entire Gospels just the final week of Jesus' life. That's how critical this time is to our faith. And he's standing before the, the Sanhedrin, which would be basically the, the Jewish ruling government court system, if you will. And he's standing there, and the guy who is, in a sense, the most important, the high priest, eventually, after they've tried to get Jesus over and over and over again with false accusation after false accusation. And, again, just a, I don't get to teach a lot on Wednesday, so side note here. You don't have to always defend yourself. God does an amazing job of doing it for you. Just a side note. That's a free one. Lots of free ones here for you. Jesus stands silently, and despite the best efforts of a well-organized attempt to get false accusations to stick to make him guilty of something, they could not get them to even agree on the false accusations. Finally, exasperated, the high priest is like, okay, I charge you under God to tell me, are you... He doesn't use the phrase son of God, but for, for our understanding, are you the son of God? And depending on which gospel you're reading, and I won't go into all the Greek, but depending on which gospel you're reading, we'll use Mark here, he says, essentially, yes, I am. And then he alludes to two scriptures, Psalm 110, 1, which you don't need to know that one for talking to people, but for your own personal thing, notes, he references Psalm 110, 1, and Daniel 7.13, where he basically says, and I tell you, you will see the Son of Man, a title Jesus used of himself, and many speculate part of the reason for that is to decouple from all the presuppositions and stereotypes and biases people had about what Messiah and all the other titles meant. So to get outside of that, he used a title, very obscure title, Son of Man, which I believe, ooh, should have looked that up in the notes, but I think it's from Ezekiel mainly. So Son of Man is the title he used. He says, I'll tell you, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. We can paraphrase it down to use a word that we'll all be comfortable with. And you'll see him coming down on the clouds. Again, clearly saying, not only am I God, the Son of God, but I am God. Interesting in my studying for this was... And it seems so obvious. You guys ever have that where something sounds obvious? You're like, I should have probably known that, but you just never thought about it or connected? That was one of those moments. It was not, in the Jewish law, wrong to claim to be the Messiah. It wasn't blasphemous to say you were the Messiah. In fact, 
I don't remember the exact time frame, but 100 or so years after Jesus, there was a particular leader in a rebellion against Rome that one of the rabbis called the Messiah. And even after his death, they still called him the Messiah. It was never a problem. What was blasphemous wasn't even saying he would destroy the temple, which was one of the false accusations, if you go back and look at that. What was blasphemous was the claim to be God himself, which is what made the high priest and the rest of them say he's guilty and deserves to die. Once again, Jesus didn't just claim to be the Messiah, which means anointed one, essentially, but he's claiming that I am God, I will be sitting next to God, I have the honor of God, and I'm coming back as such, which made them angry. So like, how could you, a mere person, claim to be God? So anybody who tells you, and there are people who try to argue this, that Jesus never claimed to be God is untrue. Completely untrue. Did Jesus say, and I'm going to speak to this one because most people won't argue this, did Jesus actually say that he's the only way to God? Yes. Easiest one, John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus clearly said these things. So, for time's sake, the next thing, after you verify what somebody says, you have to ask a pretty simple series of questions. Did the person intend what they said, and can they enforce it? What I mean by that? Have you ever, don't have to literally answer me, but have you ever been upset with somebody and said something you never really meant to do? Like, I'm leaving, I'm never coming back, and then you came back a few hours later? You didn't intend it, you were just upset, so you threw off something to hurt somebody because of your anger. Or maybe you said something like, hey, can you help me move this Friday? And you said, yeah, I'll be there, and then somehow you miraculously forget that that was going on. You never intended it. You were just kind of off like, yeah, and somehow everything lines up perfectly and I happen to wake up and be available and nothing else possibly could be going on. I'll be there. You didn't really intend to. Now, some would call that lying. I understand. But we're talking about intention. The other part is, can you do something about it? So as a bus driver, one thing that we were trained over and over on to do is never say something as a consequence you can't actually do. So, for example, some kid is mouthing off at you. Don't turn around and say, you will be suspended from this bus. You don't have, as a bus driver, that authority. So, it goes really bad, really quickly, if kids start to realize you're making empty threats. You lose respect. In fact, as parents, not a parent, so some people are like, how can you tell me this? Just good wisdom. Never threaten a discipline to a child you don't actually plan on enforcing. You lose credibility very quickly. What's that? I'll turn it around and you're like in Georgia. Yeah, right. I'm sure you're really going to drive me back home. You know, so, although my mom really did have one that we never really tested. I mean, we would, oh man, I'll have to edit this out probably. It's going to sound like child abuse and it wasn't. <laughs> my mom would spank us with this wooden brush. Oh, obviously you guys have not heard the latest in this world, what you can and cannot do. So, we got spanked with a button brush, and, uh, and it didn't really hurt, and I'm, I'm, now that I'm older, I realize she didn't intend it to hurt, but as a kid, you don't know, you're like, ah, you can't phase me, and then, like, it'd be like, alright, you got, like, five or whatever, and then it was, like, ten or a thousand, I don't know, eventually, she's like, if you don't stop, I will beat you until you're blistered, and, and they were like, you know, maybe we should stop, <laughs> so, I believe that threat from my mom, <laughs> never found out, though. Uh, boy, is it a skill set to be able to push your parents' buttons. Anyhow, moving on. Most of the kids aren't in here, so a few teens are, but that's okay. So, <laughs> so, can you enforce it? So again, when you look at something, using Putin again as the thread here, can Putin act, did he actually intend what he said? Well, nobody really knows, do they? He knows. Maybe a few select people know, but nobody really knows if he intends it. Can he do it? It appears like he could actually do it. So he has the enforceability, but we don't know the intention. So take that and apply it to Jesus. Did Jesus intend what he said? That without him, people go to hell. It is a faith step. Let's be honest. There's a step of faith because only God knows truly what he means. But it seems, based on the evidence in Scripture, including his willingness to come from heaven, be born as a man, die a horrible, wretched death on the cross, go through everything he did, be buried and rise again, 
Now, he was pretty serious about this, and he intended what he said. Can he do what he said he would do? 100%. Not only as God does he have the right and authority, but one scripture in particular I really love to help exemplify this. And that's actually found, I'll use the one in Mark, which is Mark 2, 1 to 12. But it's, there's a couple other spots. I think it's in Luke and Matthew. Uh, it should be 2, 1 to 12. Let me just double check. I was really thinking to be the wrong one. Yeah, it's somewhere in my notes. I'll look it up later. Sorry. But, see, if I don't read them, I actually go through them. I'm already pages in. It's Mark 2, 1 to 12. It's so much easier without reading. <clears throat> Unfortunately, if they look at the notes and I don't line up, I get graded down. So, I have to somehow do it perfect. And so... Jesus is talking about a paralytic who comes to him. In fact, his friends bring him to him. And if you look in the Gospel of Mark in particular, you find out they drop him through the roof into a crowded area. So there's a lot of people paying attention to him. And Jesus, upon seeing him and talking about how great the faith is, doesn't start with a healing, which is kind of peculiar. Because if I went to somebody and said, hey, I really, you know, whatever. I, you know, I'm really, I'm pretty tired. Um... You know, can I get a room at the, the hotel? They're like, no, actually, I wanted to start by giving you, a, you know, uh, an explanation of what's going on in the current quantum physics. I'd be like, I just like a room. You know what I'm saying? I'm just tired. Or if I'm really hungry and the person starts rubbing my shoulders, like, man, you seem a little tense. Like, well, that's great. I, I just really am actually hungry. The guy comes looking for healing, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Which was what he really needs. But it's not, it, what's crazy in this moment, it's just not even in many ways about the paralyzed man at all. He says that, and all the religious leaders, the teachers of the law, they're like, who is this guy? What is he, who does he think he is? I'm paraphrasing in modern English. Nobody but God alone could forgive sins. And Jesus, because he's God, knows their thoughts, and you could argue how, if it's the Holy Spirit, whatever, another day, another time on that discussion. He says, why do you... Ask among yourselves and think about, you know, who can forgive sins and why I do. He says, I did this so that you may know. Because he said, what's easier? Let me get to that important part. What is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to heal them? Now, for Jesus, both are easy. But if somebody came to me and I either could just, in my mouth, say your sins are forgiven or get out of that wheelchair and walk, a lot easier Maybe I don't have the authority, but a lot easier if I'm going to do a magic trick. It's like, oh, look, it happened. His sins are forgiven. Yeah, but next. And like, easy. He said, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Rise up, take your mat and walk. And he's healed. Jesus purposely was proving he can do the things he's saying. Can Jesus be the one that forgives your sins so you can enter heaven? A hundred percent. One hundred percent. So once you get to that, see, this is the key part. If people will be honest, and I'll, I'll say this again in a little bit, but this doesn't mean somebody who's apathetic to the thing of God will actually listen. But it gives you an opportunity because if somebody is being serious and honest and looking for truth, They'll at least ask themselves, in of essentially the Bible in this case, is this true, and can God do something about it? And if you look, you cannot come, I think, to any other reasonable conclusion than yes, he said it, yes, he meant it, yes, he can do it. Which leads to the final thing that would have to happen. And this is really what it's always about. What do you do with that? What do you do? See, when it comes to something, a claim, hearing about something that's happening, you really kind of have a few different options. I would just summarize them as kind of basically a couple categories here. Two big ones is basically you have you do nothing because it's for your information, doesn't apply to you. You know, somebody's talking to me about the newest fishing lure, don't care, doesn't apply to me, there's nothing I'm going to do with it. Somebody comes up and tells me what's going on with the lions, Besides for the fact I'm probably getting ready to laugh at the record, don't care, has nothing to do with me. 
somebody comes up to me to talk about, you know, whatever, what's happening, you know, over in Oklahoma at some random town of 2,000 people at the grocery store, don't care, has nothing to do with me, unless it's like people who watch fail videos on YouTube, then you might laugh. But outside of that, don't care. Sometimes the information is just for your, just for you to know. Like sometimes you hear people who have said, hey, you know, it's like a trivia piece of information. Like, did you know, you know, such and such was the 11th president? Don't know right offhand. I'm just making it up on as I go, so don't quiz me on that. You know, just trivia. Doesn't really matter. It's just for your information. Sometimes the information is something you can listen. You're like, you know that, you know, it, maybe that's for another day. If you're 12 and you hear about saving up in a Roth IRA, you're probably disregarding it for now. Like, yeah, it doesn't really apply to me at this stage. Maybe when I'm 18, I care. Maybe when I get my first job, I care. But right now, you're going to probably defer that. On the other hand, you have, you hear something, and it's like there's a call to action. With Jesus, there's a clear call to action. You have to make a decision. So, you can either say, I'm going to accept Jesus, or I'm going to reject Jesus. Doing nothing, ignoring it, is a decision. And that's the problem. There is no actual way to not make a decision. Every time we encounter something, you're making a decision. Every time. Coming to church tonight was a decision. If you're driving home and you see a McDonald's billboard that says, Open late, come eat, you make a decision. Maybe it's easy. You're like, never will I eat there ever in my life. Maybe it's hard. Maybe you're like, man, that fry, those fries really do look good. I don't know. But it's a decision. Even a stoplight, and it turns red. You make a decision. Hopefully you make the right decision. Stop. Red does not mean speed up. Just a heads up. I know some people think yellow is like the key to see can you make it. I can't comment. But do what you want with that information. So what I'm getting at is it's this, you ha we have to make a decision. Inaction, freezing up, anything like that is still in a sense, a decision. It's choosing not to act. So it is, by extension, a choice. So when it comes to something like who in the nuclear missiles, nothing we really are going to do besides if you're a Christian, you can pray. Then maybe that's your choice. Maybe you're like, God, please somehow bring an end to this mess. It's a great thing to be praying. Probably a little more articulate than what I just did, but you get the point. When it comes to Jesus, we have to make a choice. One important thing that actually is extremely helpful. Again, I'm not going to give a lot of techniques, but this one is helpful. Is to borrow from C.S. Lewis. Mere Christianity, we are, I mean, maybe he writes in other areas, but in Mere Christianity, he talks about the concept that you may have heard, the liar, lunatic, or lord. Where basically, he goes on to explain, and I won't try to paraphrase down or quote two pages of material, but he essentially says this, Jesus leaves absolutely no room for the notion that he's just a good teacher. Because a good teacher who basically says, I'm the only way to go, that if you don't believe me, you're going to hell, and many other things that Jesus taught would not be just a good moral teacher. He's either a lunatic, thinking he's God, or he knows he's not God and he's deceiving people, making him a liar, a.k.a. what he calls the devil. Or he actually is who he says he is, which is Lord, Meaning, your response is to submit to his lordship. But to say that Jesus is just another good moral teacher with Buddha, and Muhammad, and Moses, is not only insulting to what God actually has said in the scriptures, but it's disingenuous. Because nobody could read what Jesus said and come to that conclusion. So, people are left with the choice. What do you do with that? And borrowing from Dr. Frank Turek here, one of my favorite questions is, if Christianity was true, would you accept it? See, underneath all the apathy, behind the hypo hypocrisy arguments, behind the argument of the Bible's not real, it's the telephone game, behind all of it is, generally speaking, not an intellectual argument at all. It's, it's emotional. The reason it's emotional is, when you ask that question, the response will tell you everything you need to know, generally speaking. If somebody was actually being honest and truthful and looking into what was going on and thinking about life and eternity and all that, and you said if Christianity was true, the answer should be yes. Hesitations, hemming and hawing, no. They're not actually looking for an intellectual reason not to believe. 
They're just finding an argument to convince themselves that they're right and justified in rejecting Jesus. See, the reality, going back to to a little what you said about the power, the reality is we think more persuasive arguments, as I started with, will help people to believe. But when somebody is not looking for truth, and they're not looking for a reason to believe, all the persuasive arguments you bring only make it more frustrating for you and the other person because they're not listening to accept. They're only looking to reject. And unfortunately, in those situations, there's nothing you can do. And I believe Pastor Danny recently preached in here on the parable of the sower, which will be my final illustration for this. Jesus, going to the cross, knew fully that everybody would accept him. Yet he did it anyhow for everybody. There's a lot of examples, but the parable of the sower, the reason I think this is such an amazing example of this is because when we look at what Jesus says, he says a sower, referring to him himself specifically, but in general, people going out, sowing the seed. And again, I'm not here to re-preach a message from Pastor Danny. And it should be online if you want to listen to more in depth on this. You know, the seed, the, the good news, the gospel, the thing that brings hope, life, and salvation. Some hear it, and it never even gets below the surface. It just sits like a hard ground, and the, the birds of the air, which is talking about like satanic power, Satan himself, and demons, world ideas, human nature, doesn't really matter what the labels are, all these things that conspire together against the Lord, come and snatch it. Others, like seed landing in shallow so soil with rocks just below the surface, because the, they can quickly take root, they grow up fast. But unfortunately, because there's no real root. The, the sun comes when persecution and difficulty comes. The, the roots wither. The plant dies and it burns up and is dead. Other seed falls amongst the thorns. Which is the, the idea of the cares of this world and life. And the deceitfulness of riches. And all these things that most Americans will find as a struggle. Because of the opportunities we have. And it chokes the life of the seed out so it becomes unfruitful. But some... What's that percentage? I don't know. People like seem to think because it's four things, it must be 25%. It could be 5%. We don't know. But some are like the good soil that the seed lands on, and it's a good soil, and it produces a harvest of 36 and 100 fold. It's not a giving talk. That's the word of God in our life bringing transformation that brings life to other people with life giving fruit. As a person talking to somebody about Jesus, it's not your job to save them. Yeah. The Holy Spirit. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%, which is why... No, 100%. Which is why the whole point behind this is not technique. Not technique. I remember... Man, time flies when you're having fun. Sorry, we didn't get to a lot of rabbit trails anymore. I remember one time I was with uh, Kyle, the guy I was referencing earlier. We've been friends a long time. And we were... I don't remember if we were out running, walking, talking, or playing disc golf. I don't remember. But we were out hanging out in, in Grand Ledge. And we wanted to get back for this church service because at the church they were planning on talking about essentially is Jesus the only way to God? Because they, they, were, they were around MSG campus, so they had a lot of people recently had asking them that question. And to be honest, I was not very confident that they would answer yes. So I guess that little bit of that chloric black and white part of me was ready to go. Like, all right, they say something ridiculous. This could be interesting. So we wanted to be there, and as we were out walking, we came across these, this couple, these two individuals, and I don't even remember how we got talking about Jesus with them. And I am, once I get laser focused on something, I'm in. I, I don't care. I, I'm focused. It's going to happen. Like, this is, we're, this is a done deal. Not, I, I'm not a salesman. I'd probably be a terrible salesman, because it's like, no, the one sale matters here. I'll give up on 99 sales to get the one. And... 
And so I'm like in on it. I'm focused. Kyle and I were sitting there having this conversation with these two. And it kind of gets to a stalemate, if you will. Now, I'm older. I'm wiser. I can obviously look back on the situation and can see a lot of things. But the reality is at that time, I just knew some basics. And one of the basics I knew is one of the worst things that happens in evangelism is we don't actually ask somebody to accept Jesus. We'll go by and we'll be like, hey, you know, talking about Jesus. And we'll be like, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian. We're like, oh, that's really cool. What's that mean? And you get talking and you're like, yeah, so, you know, if you ever want to come to church, what? No. Ask after the first question. Do you know, like, do you know him? Do you want to be saved? Like, you don't use the word saved because they probably want what that means. But do you, would you, would you like to know more who Jesus is? Are you interested in finding out what it means to have a relationship with him? Find words that make sense. I'm not in the story. So I'm trying to basically seal this deal. I'm like, all right, you want to, you want to commit? And she's like, no. And I'm like, no, no, you, you, you really want to, right? <laughs> and again, I'm a lot older, wiser, and I realize that's not the best approach because you, you can get somebody to say a prayer. That doesn't mean they mean it. Yeah. But on the flip side, let me just encourage you. There's people looking. Maybe some of you, this is your story. I don't know. But maybe you were just somewhere and somehow you heard or you, you had a person who crossed your path. There was a friend you, you hadn't seen in a while. Something. And all of a sudden they start talking about God and you're like, I need this. And you were looking. You might not have known you were looking, but you were looking. And I was at a, a restaurant one time, and I was with this guy from the church I was interning at, at the time, and he was taking this evangelism class, and in this class, the only way to pass was in the eight weeks to lead somebody to Jesus. You automatically failed if you did not. There was, it doesn't matter how you tested on the final, it doesn't matter how you did on homework, you automatically fail, which makes sense, it is an evangelism class. And so the teacher would do anything and everything to set you up for success. It was not a lack of effort on his part. People tried getting him fired. And people would come and apologize to him afterwards because of what God would do as a result of taking that class. Family members getting saved. So this guy is in this class. He's auditing it. There is no grade. But he was wanting to grow and just being able, as a person who loved God, to go out and talk to people about Jesus. And we're at this restaurant. And as you can hear, I'm not afraid to talk to someone about Jesus at a restaurant, hence Mitchell's opening joke about it. And we're at this restaurant, and we get talking to the waitress, this gentleman and I, years ago. And I don't remember the details, except for to say at the end, we're kind of talking. And I'm just like, hey, would you be interested in accepting Jesus as your Savior? You know, again, whatever the words are. And she said yes. And I was like, really? <laughs> And so she, right there, bows down at the table and accepts Jesus. Yeah, it is awesome. She leaves, and I almost said the guy's name by accident. But, so I told the guy, I'm like, hey, okay, that's normally not like that. <laughs> like, I think God had brought somebody who was ready because of the encouragement he needed. I don't say that because, wow, we, that's, that's another notch on the belt. That's stupid thinking. It's not about notches. It's not about being a good Christian. But if you believe what Jesus said, that only through him can somebody have eternal life, and we don't care and love people enough to actually share that news, it's very unloving, actually. They're not notches on our belt. It's not the good Christian duty. It's not Friday night at 6 o'clock activity. It's a life of believing Jesus truly is the only hope for a person. You might be planting a seed, and that seed that day might be getting picked up by the birds of the air. You might be the plow horse breaking up hard ground. You might be the person who comes by and waters a seed somebody planted the last week. You don't know what your role is. You just know you're being faithful to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so if you come across, all I'm trying to say is when you come across, because you will, people who are apathetic, I'm just very narrow focusing on apathetic people not a technique, but if you can get them to consider what Jesus says, it's amazing how he can draw them to himself. There's a couple great examples. I won't share their story, but if you want to see how that worked, two names. Lee Strobel, who wrote The Case for Christ, set out to prove 
that whole Christianity thing is a big joke. Gave his life to Jesus at Wright's defenses for his ev evidence of him. Another guy was a Los Angeles police detective. J. Warner Wallace, I believe is his name. I know the last name's Wallace. And that his work often is called Cold Case Christianity, where he applied techniques of investigation. Same thing. He sent out to prove Christianity was wrong. He was going to tear apart the Gospels using eyewitness techniques he uses for detective work, only to be like, wow, this is really accurate and really incredible. The things we would expect to see in detective work is exactly what we see with the Gospels. So he sets up all sorts of amazing proofs for Jesus because he set out to actually investigate. So as I said, this doesn't mean you'll make somebody interested. This doesn't prove Jesus. All it does is hopefully get somebody interested in, a listening, in looking at what God said, Jesus said, and if somebody's seeking the truth, they'll find it. And God will bring them into the fold. You just have to be willing to actually love people enough to talk to them. Again, sorry, I know it's not technique, but I hope that helps to just understand some of the approaches and some of the ways you can work that thought process with people. You don't need the words, just help them work through that process. And if you can do that with some pointers, you'll really help people out a lot. Now, if your question is, have I tried this yet in the few days since I had this conversation of Bible? Not yet, but I'll be looking for that opportunity. Lord, I realize for some, this is maybe the most scary thing to do is to think about going and talking to somebody about you. And I can understand 100%. But Lord, I ask that we would take the pressure of thinking we have to somehow win an argument, know everything, convince somebody, have the perfect defense, and realize that you truly are the one who's drawing people to yourself. Lord, I ask that we would have enough fire in our heart, compassion, that we would actually be willing when you put your finger out there and say, that person, they need to hear something from me. That we would follow your leading and be empowered by your spirit to go talk to them. In fact, Lord, I just ask even now for just as the disciples prayed for a fresh boldness and a fresh filling of your spirit, that in this moment that we would experience, or those who later listening online would experience a fresh infilling of your spirit and a fresh boldness love and compassion, but a boldness and a firmness to stand on what is true. Ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. Glad you're here. Have a good night. Yeah. <laughs> well,